Well, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be here at Tennessee Temple University. All three of my kids went to school here. I almost went to school here, was registered and enrolled, and ended up going to Midwestern instead, Midwestern Baptist College. But it's good to be here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'm going to share with you this morning what we call the Hoven Theory. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? I think Christians better have a good answer to the skeptics and scoffers. If you do any kind of evangelism at all, if you try to win anybody to the Lord, you're going to run into people who have a big obstacle to overcome called evolution theory. They've all been taught for years and years and years that the earth is billions of years old. It took billions of years to form the different layers of geologic strata. And you're going to have to overcome all that if you're going to win them to the Lord. First thing a missionary has to do is learn the language so he can talk to the people he's trying to reach. And I think we as Christians better learn some of the language and be able to reach the people we're trying to reach in this community and around the world for that matter. Now, the Bible teaches the earth is about 6,000 years old, not billions of years old. If that's true, then we better explain some things. How do we get these giant canyons on earth like Grand Canyon, even canyons on Mars bigger than Grand Canyon? How do we explain that? How do we explain the frozen mammoths, the big, huge, hairy, hippie elephants that are frozen standing up, some of them? Where did all the water for the flood come from? Where did the water go after the flood was over? These are fair questions that the atheists are asking, and we better have an answer for them. Where does the Ice Age fit into the Bible? Why do kangaroos end up only in Australia? Where was the Garden of Eden? What did God do before the creation? I mean, there are thousands of questions that we as Christians are going to come up against as we deal with the lost trying to bring them to Christ. That is my prayer that this session, our video number six of our series, The Hoven Theory, will give you an outline or a theory of world history that will give you the skeleton to hang the meat on. This is just a theory. I'm not particularly attached to any, any, any particular theories. If somebody finds something wrong, I'll change it, okay? But a lot of people have influenced this, and I, so far, after 16 years of speaking and teaching on this topic, have not found any serious flaws with the theory. So if you come up with some, please let me know. We're going to cover three main things today. The creation, which we covered earlier on seminar part two, just touch on that. The curse, God put a curse on the ground. And then the catastrophe, the flood. What caused the flood in the days of Noah? We start off with the creation. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Before the flood came, the Bible says the people lived to be over 900 years old. You realize you could learn a lot in 900 years? Many people have never even thought of this, but Adam spoke every language in the world. Because there was only one, okay? Uh, and he was married to the prettiest girl in the world too, by the way. Um, things were very different before the flood came. We cover all that on videotape number two of our series. So get that seminar too if you don't have that one. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? And the reason they scoff, it says, is because of their lust. They don't want God telling them what to do. That's the bottom line every single time. I've never seen an exception to that. After doing over 90 debates at universities and about 7,000 radio and TV call-in talk shows, I'm convinced the only reason people scoff at the Scriptures is because of their lust. There's no scientific reason to reject the Bible, and there's no scientific reason to accept evolution. But they just don't like God telling them what to do. Bottom line. The scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. This is called the uniformitarian doctrine. Hey, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. Long, slow, gradual processes. We cover more on that on videotape number four. The Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. The scoffers are willingly ignorant <clears throat> of how God made the heavens, and notice heaven is plural, and how the earth was standing in the water and out of the water. We cover more on that on videotape number two of our series, what the Garden of Eden was like. But the scoffers are ignorant of the creation, and they're ignorant of the flood. See, the world was overflowed with water and perished. The two things the scoffers are ignorant of are the creation, about 6,000 years ago, and the flood, about 4,400 years ago. They don't want to admit God created the world because that would mean He owns it and He makes the rules. And they don't want to admit there was a flood because that means He has the authority to judge His creation. And I think we as Christians better have a good understanding of what that creation was like and what that flood did to the world so we can understand how things are today and be better prepared to evangelize this world we're called on to reach. Now, the scoffers are also ignorant of the coming judgment. 
There's a judgment coming soon, folks, to a city near you. Well, the scoffers don't like the creation idea. They don't like the flood idea. And they sure don't like the coming judgment idea. But if we can get a good understanding on these three, I think we'll be more effective in our evangelism of this world. The Bible teaches the world was created about 6,000 years ago, and God made a perfect creation. Dinosaurs lived with Adam and Eve. It was a wonderful place. We cover that on seminar two. And then God put a curse on the ground because of their sin. The Lord said, Adam, where are you? He was hiding, of course, because of his sin. He said, have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you should not eat of it? Adam's first response. God said, Adam, have you eaten of the tree? Adam says, the woman that you gave me, he tries to pass the buck, you know. Well, God, this is really your fault that I did this, you know. Because if you hadn't given her to me, I wouldn't have this problem. And if you hadn't made her in the first place, we wouldn't have this problem. Everybody does that. They try to pass the buck, you know. Lord, uh, the woman that you made, in other words, God, it's her fault and your fault. But finally he confessed and says, yes, I ate of the tree. And then he said to the woman, uh, what have you done? And she said, well, the serpent, uh, implying that you made, tricked me and I ate. She finally reluctantly confessed. And then God said to the serpent, you're going to be cursed and crawl on your belly all your life. He said to the woman, one of your curses is the man's going to rule over you. It's one of the curses, girls. The husband gets to be the boss, okay? And it is a curse in many cases, okay? Um, and to the man, he said, I'm going to curse the ground for your sake. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. This is a fascinating verse. God said, Adam, I'm going to curse the ground for your own good. It's good that the ground is cursed because now you have to work for a living. This is going to keep you busy. You're going to work all day. You're going to go home tired. What if, what if God provided everything for everybody all the time and you never had to work a moment in your life? All we do is sit around and think up ways to get in trouble. That's one of the problems with welfare. The Bible says God's welfare program is real simple. If you don't work, you don't eat. That was my welfare program with my kids growing up. You don't work, you don't eat. Plain and simple. It doesn't take long. They get their chores done. In the morning, you give them a list of things to do. You know, make your bed, uh, do your homework, blah, blah, blah. You sit down for supper. You all pray together. Lord, bless the bunch as they crunch the lunch. Amen. And you look, oh, stop right before anybody eats. Let's see. Uh, notice, son, your bedroom's not clean. And daughter, your homework's not done. So you guys go finish that and come on back and eat when you're done. You only got to do that once to get their attention. You don't work, you don't eat. That's God's welfare program. But in America, we got a serious problem because we, we pay people to not work. And God said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Work is one of the best things for you. It's wonderful therapy. The Lord said, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, and then you're going to return to the dust when it's over. You're going to die. Then along came the flood in the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6. This is mostly what we're going to focus on today. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And the earth was filled with violence. Everybody was wicked. And God said, that's it. Noah, go build a boat. And God said, make thee an ark. And Noah said to his boys, hey boys, go for wood. We got to build a boat. And so they went and got all this wood and they built a big boat. And we cover more on that. People said, oh, wait a minute, wait, hold it. Why would God make a flood for the whole world? Why not just kill all the bad people? Isn't that kind of cruel to destroy the whole world? I mean, after all, the penguins didn't sin. Well, no, God destroyed the whole world. I think there are some things to consider about this flood. Number one, the flood left evidence where a miracle would not. If God had just said, okay, I want everybody to die except Noah and his family, what evidence would be left behind from that? The effects are here today for us to see and remember the judgment of God on sin. Plus, by God telling Noah to build the boat, it gave everybody warning time. Here's Noah out there probably for who knows how long. Some people say seven years. Some people say 120 years. The Bible doesn't say. But Noah's building this ark for a long time. People are watching him put this big boat together and said, man, Noah, are you crazy? What are you doing? He says, man, it's going to rain. Now keep in mind, it probably, I don't think you could prove this dogmatically, but it probably never rained before the flood came. So Noah was preaching about something that had never happened. He said, hey guys, guess what? Rain is going to fall out of the sky. Everybody's looking around saying, yeah, right. That's never happened. They thought he was nuts. Hey, we're doing the same thing today as Christians. We're going around saying, hey, one of these days, an angel is going to come down with the Lord, and they're going to come to the clouds and blow a trumpet, doo -doo -doo, and the Southern Baptists rise first, you know, the dead in Christ go first, and then the rest of us are going to take off for heaven. 
And everybody was looking at us saying, yeah, right. Nobody's ever heard a trumpet blow from a cloud and saw people take off for the clouds. I mean, that's just never happened. We're preaching that something's going to happen that has never happened in the history of humanity. That's what Noah was doing. He was preaching something's going to happen, and what he's preaching about had never happened. So while he's preaching, this gave people a chance to repent. People say, wait a minute, how could the world flood? Could it rain enough to cover Mount Everest? I was in a debate one time, and this skeptic stood up, and he said, Hovind, do you realize when it rains, it releases heat into the atmosphere? I said, yes, sir, I taught physics. It's called the latent heat of condensation. What's your question? He said, well, if it rained enough to cover Mount Everest, the heat would cook the entire world. I said, you are exactly right. He said, but don't you think it rained enough to cover Mount Everest? I said, no, I've never said that. He said, well, do you think Mount Everest was covered? I said, well, I don't think Mount Everest was there. I don't think the mountains even formed till late in the flood. The Bible covers that in Psalm 104. We'll get into that later when we talk about the mountain ranges forming on this planet. But no, I don't think it rained enough to cover Mount Everest. I don't know any Christians that teach that. I think what happened was the whole world was covered with water, but the water didn't come from rain. Very little water for the flood came from rain. So they build up this straw man that if it rained enough to cover Mount Everest, it would cook the world, and that's correct, but it's an artificial argument. That's not where the water came from. There are several theories about what caused the flood in the days of Noah. I'm going to share with you my theory in a few minutes, the Hoven theory of what may have caused it. We call it that because I don't want anybody else to have to take the blame for it if it's wrong. I will take the blame if it's wrong. And this will not be super evangelistic. It's just a matter of giving you some scientific evidence to put things together in your mind and say, wow, maybe that's what happened, and give you an answer to some of the skeptics and scoffers and atheists. But we need to understand a couple things. The original creation was very different. The Bible says there was not only the earth, but there was water in the crust of the earth, under the crust of the earth, actually. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas. That's an interesting verse. The earth was built on top of the water. Psalm 133, He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. What today is in the oceans on the surface used to be in the crust of the earth, stored up in big subterranean chambers. Psalm 136, He stretched out the earth above the waters. Better read that verse very carefully. That's given us a powerful clue of what the original creation was like. And then the fountains of the deep broke open. The water that used to be in the crust went shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. The Bible says in Job 38, Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth, when it issued out of the womb? Well, I tell you what, if you've never seen a baby born, when the water comes breaking out of the womb, it is an amazing process. One of my friends was in college. His wife was standing there cooking breakfast at the kitchen, uh, kitchen, in the kitchen, and her water broke. <laughs> Just like she wet her pants all over the floor. Her husband came running in. What happened? What happened? He slipped and broke his arm, and she had to drive him to the hospital and get his arm set. What a mess when babies are born. I delivered one of my kids at home, and <laughs> when the water issues out of the womb, it is a royal mess. And God, he's telling us here in the book of Job, God is talking here in chapter 38. Uh, when that water issued out of the earth, it just burst out of the earth. And break, he says, and goes on and says, And break up for it my decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. I believe the earth broke up at the time of the flood, and we still have the scars all over the planet where this happened. They're called fault lines. I lived right by the San Andreas Fault. I've studied the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've studied them, okay? There's no question the earth is busted up into plates, and there's no question these plates are moving. And when they move, it causes tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanoes. There's no question that stuff happens. The question is, when did this happen to the earth? I think it happened about 40, 400 years ago at the very beginning of the flood. And evolutionists will say, so, well, don't you see that's proof of Pangaea? These continents fit together. Can't you see how South America and Africa seem to be a fit? Well, yeah, now hold on a minute. How many have ever heard of Pangaea? They teach us in the textbooks like some kind of fact, you know, all the continents used to fit together. I say, guys, now wait a minute. There's a couple things you ought to consider about this Pangaea theory before you get too excited. First of all, they'll say South America and Africa seem to fit. Yeah, my house and the neighbor's house would fit too if you slid them together. What does that prove? Nothing. <laughs> It doesn't prove the street oozed up in between them and the houses slid apart, okay? It's a pure coincidence. The shape of these continents is an absolute pure coincidence based upon the water level. The evidence they use for continental drift is interesting. They'll say the shapes of the continent seem to fit. Similar fossils are found in opposite sides of the ocean. 
Well, that may be true. But it's also true those same fossils are found literally all over the world. Those fossils found all over the world is just as much evidence of a flood. I mean, a worldwide flood, how far could the dead animals float around? Uh, quite a ways, right? And then they'll say there are magnetic reversals in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Well, now hold on a minute. They don't tell you they shrank Africa nearly 35 or 40 percent to make them fit, do they? They don't tell you that Mexico and Central America are gone. Hey, Senor, que pasa? Donde esta Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? They don't tell you that Europe and South America were rotated counterclockwise and Africa was rotated clockwise to make them fit. And they also don't tell you what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. Did you know if you took the water out of the oceans, you would notice there is dirt underneath? I mean, the oceans actually have a bottom to them. How many knew that already? Okay, I mean, they do have a bottom, okay? So people say, do you think the earth was ever, the continents were ever connected? I say, well, duh, they're still connected right now. What do you mean, were they connected? Hello, they're still connected. <laughs> They've always been connected. The earth has a crust. Under the low places are full of water, I understand, okay? But textbooks say, well, yes, there are magnetic reversals at the bottom of this mid-Atlantic ridge. Well, that's simply baloney, okay? There are no reversed polarity areas unless it's where rocks flipped over when the fountains of the deep broke open. That may have happened in some areas. But this, this is a lie, talking about magnetic reversals. Even uh, one author wrote in a book, uh, Deep Crustal Drilling in the North Atlantic Ocean, Science Magazine, Volume 204, he said, it's clear the simple model of uniformly magnetized crustal blocks of alternating polarity does not represent reality. What they show you in your textbooks is not reality. Now, Walt Brown has a great book called In the Beginning. I disagree with Walt Brown on a couple of key things, and he's a friend of mine and a gr brilliant man. Ph.D. in physics, taught at the Air Force Academy for years, has a website, creationscience.com. But I highly recommend his book in spite of our minor disagreements. He's got some great stuff on here on magnetic reversals. No, there are no magnetic reversals, only stronger and weaker magnetism. It's actually a jumbled up mess down there at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. See, the Earth has lost 10% of its magnetic strength in the last 150 years. It's lost 40% of its strength in the last 1,000 years. It's pretty overwhelming evidence that the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. What does that mean? Well, that means it used to be stronger. And if the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker, this creates a problem. Because if you go back in time, about 25,000 years, the magnetic strength would have been too great for life to exist here because of the heat generated. And so the evolutionists have to find an answer for the problem. Hey, we're watching the magnetic field decline, so it must be going through reversals. It has never been observed to reverse. It's only been observed to decline. I think Walt Brown has the best theory on continental drift. Let me play this for you real quickly. This is the, what's called the hydroplate theory by Dr. Brown. To me, it answers a lot of questions. We can see on our planet 17 very strange features that can now be systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose waters erupted from subterranean chambers with an energy release exceeding the explosion of 10 billion hydrogen bombs. This explanation shows us just how rapidly major mountains formed. It explains the coal and oil deposits, rapid continental drift, why ocean floors have huge trenches and hundreds of canyons and volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layered strata and most of the fossil record, the so-called ice ages and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. The pre-flood Earth probably had one very large supercontinent containing lush vegetation, seas, rivers, and minor mountains. According to the hydroplate theory, the pre-flood Earth had a lot of subterranean water, about half of what is now in our oceans. This water was in interconnected chambers, forming a thin spherical shell, about half a mile thick, perhaps 10 miles, below the Earth's surface. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water chamber stretched the overlying crust just as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack which grew in both directions at about three miles per second. The crack following the path of least resistance 
encircled the globe in about two hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlying crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 10 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of the rupture. Calculations show that all along this globe encircling crack, fountains of water jetted supersonically over 20 miles into the atmosphere. The spray from this enormous fountain produced torrential rains such as the Earth has never experienced before or after. The Bible states that all the fountains of the great deep burst open on one day. And it describes these events about four and a half thousand years ago, which we can now tie together scientifically in cause and effect order as the hydroplate theory. The fountains of the great deep and the expanding steam produced violent winds. Some of the water jetting high above the cold stratosphere froze into supercooled ice crystals and produced some massive ice dumps, varying, suffocating, and instantly freezing many animals. The high pressure fountains eroded the rock on both sides of the crack and even threw up the limey contents of many pre-flood seas. Huge volumes of sediments settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. The flooding uprooted vegetation, moving it to regions where it accumulated and quickly became coal and oil by processes we can duplicate in the laboratory today. Experiments show that as erosion widened the rupture, its width became so great that the compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like the seam of a baseball. The continental plates, the hydroplates, still with lubricating water beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of about 45 miles an hour. They ran into resistances, compressed, crushed, thickened, and buckled. The portions of the hydroplates that buckled up formed mountains. Those that buckled down formed ocean trenches. This is why these features are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. The hydroplates, in sliding away from the oceanic ridges, opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters retreated. Every continental basin was naturally left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. Each lake that grew from rainfall or drainage from higher elevations spilled over its rim at the lowest point of the rim. That eroded a little notch in the rim allowing even more water to flow through the notch faster, cutting the soft flood deposited sediments even deeper. This process accelerated until all the lake's water dumped through a very deep slit, forming a canyon. The largest of these was the Grand Canyon. North and east of the Grand Canyon was a huge lake that I have identified and named Grand Lake. Its dumping released more water than is in all five of the Great Lakes combined. Grand Lake spilled over its rim, eroded its dam, 20 miles south of Page, Arizona, catastrophically forming the Grand Canyon within a few weeks. There, that is uh, Walt Brown's hydroplate theory, which to me makes the most sense of anything I've seen. Explain several things. If the crack uh, would widen around the mid-Atlantic ridge as the water is shooting out, it's going to spread out, allowing the basalt underneath to bulge up, which is precisely what happens. As the basalt bulges up, it's going to get cracks in it, and it's also going to slide the superimposing uh, plates away from them. 
they're going to slide and run into something else, and it, it, it would explain the compressed mountains we see in, uh, for instance, British Columbia, where the mountains are smashed from the end. I mean, the wrinkles go up and down. The mountain was it's like somebody pushed carpet up against the wall, causing it to wrinkle. I think Christians need to have an answer for those kind of things, and this is one of the possible answers. When the basalt cracked, the water would rush into the crack, cooling it down, and cool rock holds a magnetic field. Hot rock will lose a magnetic field. So when they found what they said were magnetic reversals at the bottom of the ocean floor, they're actually finding the old cracks where the basalt broke because there were going to be uh, warmer and cooler areas from simply the water rushing in. Those cracks are probably now all full of sediments. So don't let them tell you there are magnetic reversals. There may be a few from the rocks flipping over at the flood, but I think a much better theory is the hydroplate theory. So, as the continents were sliding away, some places are going to be sucked under, plate subduction. Now, Baumgartner has a great theory on plate subduction. I think it, his ties in here also, that uh, the plates would tend to be sucked down. You ever stir pudding up and it gets a film on top? If you push in on the film on the pudding, it'll sink to the bottom and drag the rest of it with it. Magma does the same thing from a volcano. When it cools down, the lava gets a hard crust, and then if, you, if it sinks in one place, it'll drag a whole sheet of magma of lava with it. This probably happened also during the flood. See, the continents are eroding. When it rains, you have landslides, mudslides, erosion, mass wasting, ground creep. All of those things are happening continually. Like last night in the thunderstorm here. I'm sure a lot of erosion took place around Chattanooga. Well, this mud is going to wash into the ocean. So two things are happening. The mountains are getting shorter. The oceans are filling in. But at the current rate of erosion, the continents are going to erode flat in 14 million years. So the evolutionists have a serious problem. They have to explain two things. Why aren't the oceans full of mud? Because there's only a few thousand years worth of mud in the oceans. And why haven't the mountains eroded away yet? That's why this Pangea theory is so important to them. Because they can say, oh, it's being recycled. They'll say the ocean floor doesn't have much mud because it, be, it gets pulled under and you remelt it and it comes up again in the middle. So it's being recycled. Well, that may be. But there's another reason. It may be there's not much mud down there because it's not millions of years old. Plates are moving. There's not much question about that. But that doesn't prove they've always been moving. And it doesn't prove the rate has always been the same as we see today. I think students should be told there are other options than what they're being taught in school. Now, I live right by Interstate 10 in Pensacola, Florida. Interstate 10 runs all the way from Los Angeles to Jacksonville, Florida. If I see somebody headed east on Interstate 10 at 70 miles an hour, does that prove they started in Los Angeles four days ago? Uh, no, they might have just got on at the last exit, right? And just because we see these continents moving a little bit today does not prove anything long-term historically. Don't fall for that propaganda. The continental drift theory <clears throat> is designed to avoid two problems for the evolutionist. One, the magnetic field's getting weaker. Number two, there's very little sediment in the ocean. And another explanation for that might be that the Bible is right and the earth is not billions of years old. People say, where does the Ice Age fit into the Bible? There certainly was an Ice Age. There's not much question. Ice came all the way down to Kansas City, Missouri. How many of you are from Ohio or Indiana or Michigan or Minnesota or one of these states that are covered by ice? They used to be covered by ice, okay? Actually, this time of year, they're still covered by ice. But uh, there's all kinds of evidence around those states that you can prove there really was an Ice Age. <clears throat> when ice pushes out... It piles up a pile of rocks in front of it. When the rocks are left there, when the ice melts back, it's called a terminal moraine. If it pushes the rocks to the side, it's called a lateral, lateral moraine. When the ice melts back, it leaves behind lakes called Kettle Lakes. Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, is full of Kettle Lakes. As the ice melts back, the ground actually lifts up because the weight is gone. The ground may lift up quite a ways. That's called isostatic rebound. There is no question those things actually happen. The question for the Christian is, where does this fit into the Bible? And what froze the mammoths? Some of the big, hairy, hippie elephants that are found frozen standing up, food still in their teeth. What happened to the mammoths? One year, it was reported that 20,000 mammoth tusks were uh, extracted from the ground. Just one year. 20,000 tusks. Estimates are that 5 million mammoths perished in one catastrophe. <clears throat> These red dots indicate where frozen mammoths have been found. The yellow dots indicate where frozen rhinoceros have been found. What happened to the mammoths? 
Well, some of the mammoths are frozen in the upright position. Their undigested food in their stomach and mouth is an interesting situation. They died of suffocation. There's no water found in the lungs. The small ice crystals in the blood indicate they probably froze in less than five hours. That requires something less than 300 below zero. Now, it never gets 300 below zero on Earth. The coldest temperature ever recorded from National Pornographic a geographic, is minus 127 degrees. That's pretty chilly. But that's not cold enough to freeze the mammoths. What happened to freeze the mammoths? In 1999, I was uh, preaching in Alaska, and I took the little tour on the, to out on a boat to see the Portage Glacier. And I'm standing next to this guy on the boat. I got talking to him, trying to witness to him. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I drill for oil in Barrow, Alaska, near Barrow, Alaska. I said, well, when you drill down, do you find anything interesting down there? He said, you wouldn't believe the stuff we drill into down there. He said, just a few months ago, we were drilling down. We drilled through 1,000 feet of permanently frozen ground called permafrost, and we started bringing up pieces of wood. And we always take whatever comes out of the well and lay it out on the ground so we can get a sample, a core sample of what we're drilling through to know the formation. He said, we drilled straight through a tree that was standing up. The tree was 300 feet tall, standing up, under a thousand feet of permanently frozen ground. Well, I preached in Barrow, Alaska a couple years ago. There is only one tree in Barrow, Alaska, and it is about this tall in a Chinese restaurant, and they struggle to keep it alive because they don't get much sun up there for months at a time. There are no trees outside in Barrow, Alaska. There are certainly no trees 300 feet tall. There are very few trees in the world that are 300 feet tall. How do you get a tree 300 feet tall, standing up under a thousand feet of permanently frozen ground? What happened? I'm going to give you what I call the Hoven theory of what caused all these phenomena, but I need to review a little science for you. Many people have been influential in developing this in my brain anyway. I appreciate Walt Brown and Henry Morris and Baumgartner and some of these guys that have done work. And the biblical flood in the ice epic had a great influence on me. But ultimately, I have to take the blame for this if it's wrong. I'm going to teach you a few things about science and then give you the Hoven theory. The inverse square law tells us if two objects are attracted to each other, like the earth and the moon, the force of attraction is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In English, that means if you half the distance, or if you brought the moon into one-third the distance, you take the one-third, flip it over, and square it. It's, one, it's now nine times the gravitational pull. Inverse square laws apply when you're dealing with forces involving gravity, light, magnetism, and girls. I travel every single week. I believe I've been home eight Sundays in 14 years. I flew 215 times last year. It was gone 210 days away from home. So I get to come home every week. When I get a certain distance from my wife, it's, Hello, dear, how are you doing? When you half the distance, it is four times the attraction, not two, four times the attraction. When you half the distance again, it is too late. So guys, the secret is stay about 10 feet away and you won't have a problem, okay? Now, the inverse square law is one thing to learn. The second thing you need to learn is a spinning top, any spinning object, behaves in a peculiar way if it is struck by something. If you throw a rock at a spinning top, it'll wobble around for a while, or you can do it with a gyroscope. And it'll wobble around, and then it'll, it'll recover, spinning smoothly, usually at some new crazy angle. You can actually d determine when it was struck, if you could see a graph of a wavy line of how it behaved as it was wobbling. Interesting. The Earth has no doubt wobbled through the years. The North Pole has moved around. Today, the Earth is tilted over 23 and a half degrees, which is why they always mount the globe on that 23 and a half degree angle. Stonehenge is an interesting... Uh, stone building. Apparently it was built to worship the sun at summer solstice. But today, Stonehenge does not line up. The temple Amun-Ra was also apparently built to worship the sun at summer solstice, the lo longest day of the year. But it doesn't line up. Edexus, same thing. The earth is tilted over today, and that's what causes the seasons. Uh, usually on June 21st, occasionally on June 20th, but usually June 21st, it's the longest day of the year because the earth is tilted, in, in our case with the northern hemisphere, we're tilted toward the sun. So we get more sunlight, and the North Pole gets pure sunlight all the time, 24 hours. 
George Dodwell, the famous Australian astronomer, did a lot of study of the shadows, of the solstice shadows recorded by ancient astronomers. He said, you know, it looks to me like something struck the earth. When he followed the wavy line made of the solstice shadows, he said something struck the earth about 4,350 years ago and caused the earth to wobble for several thousand years. Today the earth is pretty stable. The earth's north pole doesn't move around very much. But could it be that something actually struck planet earth about the time of Noah's flood? Now that's what the scientific evidence points toward. Interesting. Today the earth is tilted over and that's what causes the seasons. The first mention of cold weather in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 8, after the flood. I doubt they had huge polar ice caps before the flood came. I drove, flew up as far as we could fly in Canada and then drove two hours north of that, way up into central Saskatchewan. We were only right about here. There was a whole lot of earth above us. But they said this is about the limit of, of habitable uh, uh, habitable land where you can actually do farming because north of here the seasons are too harsh you can't do any farming. There is a huge chunk of planet earth north and south near the poles that is simply unusable for farmland. Now the Bible says God formed the world to be inhabited. I don't think what we have today is anything similar to what Adam and Eve saw. Next thing you need to, need to keep in mind the moon has craters on it but we never see the moon get struck by anything. Where did these craters come from on the moon? Even Mercury has craters on it. Where did these craters come from? Mars has a canyon much larger than Grand Canyon. When the scientists studied this canyon on Mars, they said, wow, this canyon formed in a matter of weeks. Because they say there was melting water in one of the craters. It overflowed the rim and washed out this canyon very, very quickly. Well, duh. Why can they see a canyon on Mars where we can't find any water for sure and say this thing formed quickly and you can look at Grand Canyon on planet Earth and can't conclude that water formed that canyon very quickly? <laughs> I don't understand the stupidity involved here. Looks to me like you ought to be able to see that. As a ridge at the edge of the crater gave way and this canyon formed in a matter of months, certainly less than a year, said one of the scientists. Next thing to keep in mind, it's called the Meisner effect. How many have ever seen two magnets? You put them together and the one will float on top of the other one. You know what I'm talking about here? It's called the Meisner effect. That's how the Japanese trains go. We rode on one of those trains when I was in Japan. Man, they go flying down the tracks with magnetic levitation. No uh, resistance that way. No friction. Next thing to keep in mind, there are comets flying around through space and these comets are extremely cold. 300 to 400 below zero Fahrenheit. Don't lick it. I need to find out if any of you are or were as dumb as I was as a kid. <clears throat> How many of you have a piece of your tongue stuck to a pump handle or a flagpole someplace on planet Earth right now because you, lick, you licked it when it was cold? Come on now, be honest. Put your hand up. Okay, there's several. All right. Don't lick something 300 below zero. Trust me on that one. Okay, that'll be the last thing you lick for a while. If you throw a snowball too fast, it'll break apart. You couldn't possibly shoot a snowball out of a cannon. If you did, it would simply break apart in pieces before it even got out the end of the barrel. So a super cold ice meteor, if it were coming toward the Earth, would build up speed because of the inverse square law. As it got going faster and faster, it would break up out in space into a bazillion little ice crystals. Those would then shower down on the Earth as super cold snow. Next thing you need to keep in mind, the Earth has a very strong magnetic field, but it's getting weaker. At the time of the flood, it was probably about 15 to 20 times stronger than it is today. The magnetic field is weakening. The magnetic field would deflect super cold ice crystals to the poles, most of them. Also, super cold ice is easily statically charged. The northern lights are caused because of the Earth's magnetic field. How many have ever seen the northern lights? Unbelievably gorgeous. If you've never seen them, it's worth just get up there. So I've seen them in South Dakota and up in Canada. Unbelievably beautiful. The northern lights are, are something that we're seeing. Anyway, the pre-flood world was very different. The world probably had a canopy of ice or water above the atmosphere. We cover that on video two. Now there are some creationists, including Walt Brown, who disagree. They say there was no canopy. And I think the arguments they use can be easily answered. And I'll be glad to discuss that if you'd like more. Next thing to keep in mind. Who on earth was Peleg? Genesis chapter 10, and I hate to say this about the Bible, so God don't listen for just a minute, okay? But Genesis 10 is boring. 
Okay, as you read through that chapter, it's got all these big names that nobody on earth can pronounce except Alexander Scorby. You know, so and so begot so and so, and he begot so and so, and he begot so and so. And you're reading through this long, boring chapter of all everybody begotten everybody, and all of a sudden you come across verse 25. And it says, Unto Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Well, now hold on a minute. Peleg is the only guy, it's, it's, it doesn't say anything about anybody else. Why does it say something about Peleg? It says, In his days was the earth divided. And then it says, His brother's name was Joktan. Nobody else gets their brother mentioned. Why would his brother be mentioned? Well, the word Joktan means shorten. Peleg means divided. Peleg was born about a hundred years after the flood. Notice he only lived to be 239. His daddy and grandpa and great grandpa lived into their 400s. What was different? What happened in the days of Peleg? Next thing you need to keep in mind the pre flood world had a canopy of water above and water under the crust of the earth. Okay? Now, I made a decision years ago as a new Christian. I was 16 when I got saved, and all the atheists in my city started coming after me, trying to get me converted you know, away from Christianity. And I had some real problems believing some of the things in the Bible. They were showing me supposed contradictions and all that. We'll cover more on that on video 7. But I had to make a decision as a 16-year-old new Christian. I said, Lord, I'm going to believe your book until somebody can prove it's wrong. Some of my friends decided they're going to doubt the Bible until it's proven right. I think that's a mistake. I think I made the right decision. I said, God, I'm going to believe you even for the things I don't understand. And he's proven himself on just about every one of them. There's a couple I've still got questions about. There was an atheist one time came to the preacher and said, Preacher, I don't believe anything in the Bible. I only believe science. He said, Preacher, if you can prove one verse out of the Bible scientifically, I'll believe it. The preacher said, Well, okay. He grabbed the atheist around the neck, grabbed his nose, and began twisting his nose. <coughs> Pretty soon, of course, the blood is pouring down his face, and the atheist said, What on earth are you doing? He said, I'm proving the Bible. It says, The ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. I don't recommend you do that, unless you get a really hardcore atheist, then you might want to try that one. But uh, I'm going to give you the Hovind theory. Now, this is supposed to be good teaching technique. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you. You get all that? We're going to go through it very quickly, eight simple steps of what I think caused the flood and explain all these strange phenomena on the planet. Then we'll go into them in a little bit more detail and then we'll close this down. Noah and the animals got safely into the ark. A 300 degree below zero ice meteor came flying toward the earth and broke up in space. As it was breaking up, some of the fragments got caught and became the rings around the planets. They became, made the craters on the moon, the craters on some of the planets, and what was left over came down and splattered on top of the north and south pole. The super cold snow fell on the poles mostly, bearing the mammoths standing up. The dump of ice on the north and south pole cracked the crust of the earth, releasing the fountains of the deep. The spreading ice caused the ice age effects, the glacier effects that we see. It buried the mammoths, made the earth wobble around for a few thousand years, and it made the canopy collapse that used to protect the earth and opened up the fountains of the deep. During the first few months of the flood, the dead animals would settle out and dead plants and get buried. They would become coal if they're plants and oil if they're animals. And those are still found today in huge graveyards. Fossils found in graveyards, oil found in big pockets under the ground. During the last few months of the flood, the unstable plates of the earth would shift around. Some places lift up, other places sink down. That's going to form ocean basins and mountain ranges. And the runoff would cause incredible erosion, like Grand Canyon, in a couple of weeks. Over the next few hundred years, the ice caps would slowly melt back, retreating to their current size. The added water from the ice melt would raise the ocean level, creating what's called a continental shelf. It would also absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which allows more radiation to get in, which is going to shorten people's lifespans. And in the days of Peleg, it finally took effect. The earth still today shows the effects of this devastating flood. Now, a little more detail on each one. God told Noah, Lord said to Noah, Come thou. Did you catch that? Listen very carefully. What did God tell Noah to do? He told him to come into the ark. He didn't say go into the ark. 
He said, come into the ark. Where does God have to be in order to say that? In the ark. That'll preach, brother. There's a sermon right there. Just right there. Come into the ark, Noah. Come with me. We're going on a little cruise. Come on in. I'm here with you. And when the flood was over, God said to Noah, go out of the ark. God was with him the whole time. That would be quite the cruise. And the Lord shut the door. By the way, good eternal security verse. If the Lord's got you saved, you're saved, okay? You can't get out of God's hand. Then this 300 degree below zero ice meteor came flying through the solar system. Some of it broke apart. It made craters on Mercury and craters on the moon. Four of the planets today still have rings around them. And the rings around these planets are made of rock and ice. Very interesting. Now, Walt Brown thinks some of the craters on the moon were formed when the fountains of the deep broke open and rocks went flying up out of Earth's gravitational pull, drifted around for a while and clobbered into the moon. He may be right on that. I don't know. But it's interesting. He thinks the comets came from Earth and water on Mars came from Earth when the fountains of the deep broke open. You can read about it for yourself if you'd like. The super cold snow would land mostly around the poles. Because super cold ice is not only affected by the magnetic field, it's affected by, it's easily statically charged. How many have seen the Van de Graaff generator where they make your hair stand up? You know, we've got one of those at our science center at Dinosaur Adventure Land. As this ice meteor came flying toward the earth, it broke apart. Pieces would, uh, would settle in around the poles mostly, causing the earth to wobble for a few hundred years. Or maybe even a few thousand years. The canopy of water overhead collapsed and it rained 40 days. The water underneath the bottom, under, under the crust, came shooting to the surface, and the water kept going up for 150 days, and everybody drowned. It probably took six or eight months to kill everybody during that flood. We all get the idea, well, it rained, everybody died first day. No, it took a long time for people to die. People would be running and fighting for higher ground, as that got more and more rare, as the water keeps coming up and up and up. For 150 days, the water increased. By the way, they're still discovering chunks of ice flying around in space. Here's an article about a scientist who discovered chunks of ice as big as this auditorium are hitting the earth all the time. They dissolve in space, but it, rain, and it rains down as water. There's water, water everywhere in space. Scientific and technology article here. If you go to the North Pole, you'll be kind of chilly and one of only 400 people that have ever been there. But up around the North Pole, there's an ocean called the Arctic Ocean. I went up to see the Arctic Ocean a couple years ago, and the guy said, Hey, Brother Hovind, you know something interesting about this ocean? It has no tide. I said, Man, I never thought of that. Taught her science for 15 years. Arctic Ocean has no tide. And who cares, right? Anyway, but there's an island up there called the uh, New Siberian Islands off the coast of Russia. There on those New Siberian Islands, they find frozen bobcats, frozen lynx, frozen camels. What happened? When they drill down through the ice, when they get to the South Pole and drill through the ice, they find coal under the ice at the South Pole. I would like to point out, Your Honor, there are no trees in Antarctica. Zero. Admiral Byrd went down there and said they saw frozen palm trees or palm leaves near the South Pole. Scientists have discovered all sorts of frozen leaves, even dinosaur fossils, plant-eating dinosaurs, near the South Pole. Thousands of well-preserved leaves found in Antarctica. Leaves on the side of a cliff 250 miles from the South Pole. And the leaves still retain their original cellular structure and organic content. They're not petrified. They're preserved. They find dinosaurs, plant-eating dinosaurs, in northern Alaska. There are no trees up there. I was there. there nothing. Not a blade of grass in most places. See, the Earth actually has two North Poles. We have a geographic North Pole where we spin around. We also have a magnetic North Pole in Canada where we actually, the compass actually points. Now here in Tennessee, it probably doesn't make a lick of difference. Your compass points north because both of them pretty much line up. But if you live in Alaska, your magnetic north is way different than the real north and pilots have to learn to adjust for that. And who cares, right? Okay. I think what happened, the mammoths were up there chomping on their tropical flowers. It was a beautiful day. And it began to snow, super cold snow. They had never seen snow before. One of the mammoths looked at his buddy and he said, Herman, this is peculiar weather we're having here. What is this white stuff falling out of the sky? I said, I don't know, but let's get out of here. They started running around trying to find a place to hide. And the snow got deeper and deeper and deeper. And they got stuck in the snow standing up. And they couldn't even fall down. 
How many of you have ever been in a snowdrift so deep you couldn't even fall over? You ever been in one of those? I think that's what happened to the mammoths. People say, well, the mammoths have long hair. They're designed for cold weather. Oh, no, mammoths are not designed for cold weather. A lot of animals in the jungle have long hair where it's hot. Okay, If the temperature is 70 degrees, long hair is just simply a decoration. It's neither. And there's a lot of things about the mammoth that shows they are not designed for cold weather. There's a whole section just in this book about mammoths are not designed for cold weather. You can read all about that. So the mammoths, some of them, ended up frozen standing up in super cold ice, 300 below zero. As the ice goes pushing out toward the equator, it's going to carve out glacial grooves. If you live in Ohio, if you go out to Kelly's Island, you can go out in the, in the uh, Lake Erie and see the glacial grooves scratches across the rock for miles. I think the ice age really happened, but it happened at the beginning of the flood. There are basically two theories among creationists about the ice age. One theory says, the Ice Age caused the Flood, which is what I believe. The other theory says the Flood caused the Ice Age. A minor difference. I don't think it's worth fighting over. But in either case, though, I think the Flood would, or the Ice Age would last several hundred years after the Flood. During the time after the Flood, as populations are growing, if somebody misbehaves, instead of building a jail and putting them in there where you've got to feed them for the rest of their life, just banish them. Say, get out of here. You can't stay with our civilization. And boy, if times were hard and just new struggling civilization like Gilligan's Island, being banished is punishment enough. Now, you're going to follow the Ice Age animals around and kill them and, uh, you know, leave your toolbox behind because you don't want to carry 50 pounds of rocks with you. You wait till you get find the mammoth herd and you make your tools on the spot and kill the mammoth. That's why they find, you know, sc uh, scrapers for skin and all kinds of flint arrowheads and stuff are found all over the world. These guys are, you know, they really do use these stone tools. To kill these animals, but they don't carry them with them. Because they're so plentiful. They're found all over the arrowheads and stuff like that. Anyway, then this super cold ice uh, at the pole would send off a cold wave. Like when you open the freezer and the cold air comes out and falls at your feet. This cold air hitting warm air would cause it to rain. And it rained 40 days and 40 nights. The canopy collapsed. The Bible says all the fountains of the deep were broken up in one day. If you read the book of Jasher, you can get it from our ministry. I cannot verify that it's legitimate, the actual book of Jasher referred to in the Bible. There is a book of Jasher referred to in the Bible. This may or may not be it. I don't know. But it's interesting reading nonetheless. In the book of Jasher it says, And on that day the Lord caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the foundations of the earth were broken up. Jasher chapter 6. Interesting. I think what happened, the dump of ice on the poles caused the earth's crust to crack. Ice spread out toward the equator, buried the mammoths, made the earth wobble, and the earth was totally covered by water. The Bible says all the high hills were covered. Now there are some idiots out there teaching it was just a local flood in the days of Noah. The Bible says the high hills were covered. It's not a local flood. If the earth were reduced down to the size of this globe right here, all the oceans in the world would only fill about one tablespoon. If you smoothed out the earth, the oceans right now would be 12,000 feet deep. And oceans average 12,000 feet deep. But if you smoothed out the earth, they would average 8,000 feet deep everywhere. There's plenty of water on the earth to cover the planet. Technically, one drop of water would cover the planet if you spread it real thin. I mean, real thin. I flew back over to Pacific one time, and I came back, I said to one of the guys in my office, I said, man, that Pacific Ocean is huge. He said, that's just the top of it. Wow, what a thought. <laughs> that is just the top of it. There's a lot of water in these oceans out there. When the climbers got to the top of Mount Everest, 1953, the year I was born, they got up here on Mount Everest, they began to find something interesting. Petrified clams on top Mount Everest. In Peru a couple years ago they found giant oysters up to 11 feet across, two miles above sea level. That's a big oyster. You should see the pearl. And these clams are interesting. I've got some on the table down here. They're petrified clams in the closed position. Now think about it for a minute. When a clam dies, it opens. The muscle inside relaxes, the ligaments on the outside pull the shell open almost instantly. When a clam dies, it opens up. How would you get bazillions of petrified clams in the closed position 
on top of mountains all over the world. Well, I would like to point out, Your Honor, that uh, Mount Everest is a little ways from the beach, number one. Number two, uh, clams do not climb mountains very well. And number three, when a clam dies, it opens. The best explanation for this is they were buried alive. Sometimes huge beds of these are found. A guy in Op, Alabama said, Brother Hovind, you want some petrified clams for a museum? I said, yeah. He said, they're four feet thick in my backyard. When he rototills his garden, he brings up thousands of petrified clams, closed petrified clams. We've got a bunch in our museum down in Pensacola, Florida. Even f fragile items like eggs are found fossilized. I believe the sediments would settle out of this flood. Fine sediments would preserve things in incredible detail. Here's a fossilized jellyfish. We have an arm to an octopus, fossilized octopus arm in our museum. Soft tissue simply doesn't fossilize under very special conditions are required. The Bible says the fountains of the deep broke open. So I think the earth got struck by a meteor. The water underneath went shooting to the surface, and the earth was covered with water. See, the earth's crust is kind of interesting. Pretty thin, actually, in some spots. Three to five miles thick under the crust, under the oceans, and 30 miles thick under the continents. The hot water from inside the earth would come shooting out, and it would kill animals that live within a certain radius of this of the crack as the hot water escaped. As the bul basalt bulged up in the middle, the plates are going to slide down, explaining, as I said earlier, about the wrinkled mountains. Take a look at these mountains in British Columbia. They're, they've been pressed from the end, wrinkled up. What happened? As the water came shooting out, the hot water would kill all sorts of things within a certain radius. If you poured a gallon of boiling water into your aquarium, it would kill all the fishies within a certain distance, okay, until the temperature was, uh, dissipated. All over the world, little tiny creatures called diatoms are found dead in great big thick beds called diatomaceous earth. These diatoms are super tiny. It takes about a thousand years to get an inch of, inch of dead diatoms at the bottom of the ocean. They very slowly accumulate. When it dries out, they pack it into a special powder called diatomaceous earth. It is used for all sorts of things. It's used as kitty litter. It's used as oil dry. Diatomaceous earth is used as swimming pool filters. Uh, for used in bricks, used in aspirin. It's used in medicines. It's used in all sorts of strange things you would never think of. It's diatomaceous earth because it is so absorbent. I was in Lompoc, California preaching, and I went to visit the world's largest diatomaceous earth quarry. I believe it's the world's largest. They're in Lompoc, California, which is right smack on top of the San Andreas Fault. There in Lompoc, California, back in 1976, they found the fossil skeleton of a whale standing on end, 80 feet long, running through diatomaceous earth. Now, I know the whale is parallel with the layers, that's okay, because the layers have tilted up also. So the thickness of the whale becomes the problem, not the length. But still, if, if this stuff accumulates an inch every thousand years, how long is a dead whale going to lay there waiting for this stuff to gather around him? Dead whales are dissolved at the bottom of the ocean in a few weeks or months. Even the bones eventually disappear. They gave me a chunk of their diatomaceous earth out there. In that one little square foot, there are dozens, maybe even up to 60, fish skeletons. You know, fish skeletons are found in diatomaceous earth, and they're found with their gills extended, their fins extended. They died terrified. Whatever was happening to them was terrifying these creatures. Fossil fish are found by the trillions. The chalk cliffs of England and Dover, England are found this way. Chalk, from the Latin word crecia, which means chalk. Chalk, 300 feet thick. There was a catastrophe that formed all this. The Bible says the waters prevailed upon the earth. I think what happened during the first part of the flood, dead things settled out. And that flood represents God's judgment on this planet. Point number five of the Hoven theory is during the first few months of the flood, the dead animals would settle out. People ask, why aren't more human fossils found? Well, humans are smarter than animals, yeah, some humans are, and some animals, and they would tend to avoid drowning till the last possible minute. Animals that are buried on top or very, very shallow soil are not going to fossilize. Think of all the millions of buffalo that were killed out west in the last few hundred years. None of them fossilized because they weren't buried. So fossils only form if an animal is buried pretty deeply and pretty quickly before it has time to decay. Marvin Lubinow says about 4,000 sets of human remains have been found. Uh, I think there are few, fewer humans than animals found fossilized because they were smarter and would avoid drowning till later in the flood, and therefore they're not going to be fossilized. We cover more on that in video 7. 
the trees that are uprooted would float around in big log mats the size of Texas. They're going to be buried and become the coal seams that we see today. Moving water does some very interesting phenomena. As water is moving, it automatically sorts things. It can form five or six layers simultaneously. There's a good videotape called Experiments in Stratification that shows the top strata can actually be older than the bottom strata. If, it's, if the water is moving, it forms multiple layers simultaneously. Moving water does some strange things. How many have ever seen those things you buy at the store with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between? And when you flip it over, it forms all these layers real quickly, okay? It doesn't take a long time. Stratification can happen very quickly. Underwater landslides, like the one we saw in Indonesia in 2004, <clears throat> can cause, uh, it's called a turbidity current. They can do enormous damage underwater, causing tsunamis on the surface, which kill 250,000 people. In 1929, there was an underwater landslide that traveled 70 miles an hour, cut two transatlantic cables. That one landslide covered 40,000 square miles. That's about the size of Ohio. One landslide underwater. As the, during the flood, the water would be swirling around, and the dead animals would tend to, you know, get caught in these little swirls called eddies. This happens today. If you walk along the river, you see the river moving one direction, but along the sides, there's little eddies, swirling water. This would happen on a global scale during the flood of Noah. As the animals would float around for a few weeks, they would rot, and their head falls off, and tail falls off, and legs fall off. And when they finally get buried, you end up with tangled up messes of dinosaur bones. Notice these backbones here have no head attached, no legs, just the backbone. Underwater landslides do enormous damage, and surface uh, animals buried on the surface under mud can be entangled up messes. Fossil graveyards are very common all over the planet. They found a concentration of fossils like logs in a log jam. If you go to um, where San Jacinto Monument in Texas, where Santa, uh, Santa Ana finally met his, met his match when the Texans caught up with him, the whole monument is made out of fossils. I mean, you look at the blocks of rock, it looks like great big blocks of stone, and they are. As you get up closer, there are bazillions of little tiny fossils in them. Here's a four animals that are found fossilized in the swimming position. Their head held up high out of the water. I believe they probably got caught in the mud as the water settled, as the mud settled out of the water, and they drowned or died in the swimming position. In one place in Africa called the Karoo Formation, they said there are 800,000 million skeletons of vertebrate animals. A lot of animals died at one time. They found iguana skeletons in a, uh, iguanodon skeletons in a Belgian coal mine extending through 100 feet of rock in the vertical position. Hmm. Up in Canada on Axel Island, they find petrified redwood stumps. You can go to Axel Island. There are no trees on Axel Island. There are certainly no redwood trees growing there. How do we get fossilized redwood stumps on Axel Island? People say, well, hey, doesn't it take millions of years for things to petrify? No, things petrify quickly. There are scores of examples can be given where things have petrified in less than 100 years. Okay? Two horse hoofs were found, petrified in Oregon. A petrified water wheel shown here in this picture. Just the minerals replaced the wood. Here's petrified firewood. Here's a fishing reel stuck in a rock. It said the rock was 300 million years old. By the way, if any of you students want to make some money, University of Chattanooga, Tennessee, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, studied this thing. Talked to the guy who owned it and analyzed the whole thing and said, man, this is amazing, a reel stuck in a rock. If you can locate the owner of the reel and get me in touch with him, I want to see if he wants to put it on loan in our museum. And anybody who can find me, the owner, uh, Dan Jones, find me the guy, get me his phone number and let me talk to him. I'll give you 50 bucks. for find, Do some research if you have sleuths up here in Tennessee you want to work on that one. UTC geology experts can't find, explain this. Why? How could a fishing reel be found in rock? If you go to Waycross, Georgia, they've got on display there at the Southern Forest World a mummified dog stuck in a tree. The dog apparently chased a coon up the tree and got stuck, and the dog is mummified. The tree was still alive. They named the dog Stucky. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. Articles on the table down there called the Limestone Cowboy. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. Here's a petrified hammer found in Hawaii. A petrified hat found in New Zealand. Petrified crayon found in Arizona. Petrified pincushion found in Wisconsin. 
A guy got found along the, uh, a beach in Montana. I was petrified, petrified man. Here's a story about a petrified man uh, in Gainesville, Tennessee. The guy died in 1881. They buried him. Fourteen years later, they were going to bury his wife next to him when she died. They dug a hole for Grandma's grave, and water seeped into the hole, into the grave. They said, oh, we don't want to bury Grandma in the water. So they buried Grandma someplace else. Then the kids got worried about Grandpa buried in the, in the water. So they dug up the grave. The body inside had turned to stone, except the arms had rotted off. The rest of the body had petrified in 14 years in a coffin in Tennessee. The man found in Fort Benton, Montana, it was in 1897, found by Tom Dunbar. The guy was five foot eight. Many medical doctors examined it and said, man, this is a petrified, complete human. Not the bones, the complete person, petrified. A lady in Sao Paulo, Brazil, was 62 years old. She went to the doctor and said, I got a pain in my side. The x rayed her and found a petrified skeleton of a baby inside. She was pregnant and didn't know it. The baby had died and turned to stone inside the woman's body. It does appear the baby was about to be born, the doctor said that examined her. I talked to a guy from Maryland. He said, yeah, I drove the ambulance. We took a woman to the hospital one time in Snowden, Washington. There's his phone number there if I talk to Brian. She said, uh, she was taken to, he said she was taken to the hospital and they removed a petrified uh, fetus from this woman. It had turned to stone in her body. Here are petrified sacks of flour found in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Here's a petrified pickle found in Montana. This is in my museum. It was found in this jar. The guy sent it to him. He said, Brother Hovind, I found a petrified pickle inside a jar. The lid rusted off. Would you want it for your museum? I said, of course. Who in their right mind would not want a petrified pickle for their museum? Here's a petrified toadstool just south of Bloomington, Illinois, in an amazing museum called the uh, Funk Gem and Mineral Museum in Shirley, Illinois. If you ever drive out there, stop and see that place. A kid, this kid in the picture here sent me these petrified acorns. He's seven years old. He said, Brother Hovind, I put, these I put the uh, acorns in a bucket of water hoping they would sprout, and I forgot about them. A year later, when Mama found them on the back porch, they had turned to stone in a bucket of water. Petrified acorns. Here's petrified peanut cluster in the Ripley's Museum in, uh, t in Florida. Here are petrified charcoal briquettes. We've got them in our museum. Come down to Pensacola and see the petrified charcoal briquettes. Here's what appears to be a petrified coconut. The whole thing is in our museum in Pensacola. Here's the fossilized arm to an octopus I referred to earlier. This is a replica of it. Petrified octopus arm. There's an article in Family and Handy Farm Devices, published 1909, on how to make petrified wood. For centuries, people have known how to make petrified wood so it will last longer. People say, no, wait a minute, aren't the fossils of similar animals found in the same layers? Doesn't that prove, you know, evolution? Because reptiles are found in the same layer. Well, if there's any sorting of the fossils, it's not proof of evolution, that's for sure. Actually, the textbooks teach the layers are well sorted, and it's simply not true. This guy, David Ropp, he's a professor at the University of Chicago, I believe. He says, <clears throat> one of the ironies of the evolution-creation debate is that creationists have accepted the mistaken notion that the fossil record shows a detailed and orderly progression. And they have gone to great lengths to accommodate this fact in their flood geology. The layers are not in the orders they would like you to think they are. Niles Eldridge said, uh, we date the layers by the fossils, and we date the fossils by the layers. It's circular reasoning. If there's any sorting to the fossil record, it's better explained by a flood. See, moving water in a flood situation does all sorts of interesting things. There's a phenomenon called cavitation which is what happened at the Glen Canyon Dam in Arizona. The water got moving too fast and it sucked the sides of the rock right off the canyon wall. Within just about 20 seconds, it made an area the size of a basketball court four feet thick, four feet deep, sucking rocks right off the side because of cavitation. There's another phenomenon called hydraulic plucking, as in addition to abrasion. Moving water in the flood would pick up debris and it's not just water moving now, it's liquid sandpaper. It's got gravel and rocks and mud and, and tree stumps and stuff in it. It's going to erode right through solid rock. It's going to abrade its way through rock. Also, there's a phenomenon called liquefaction. Liquefaction happens when sand grains are pressed and then the pressure is relieved. If you go out to the beach in Pensacola, walk out into the surf and stand there knee-deep in the water and just, just stand there for a while. As the waves come by, the high part of the wave weighs more than the low part of the wave, obviously. There's more water there. 
So the high part of the wave pushes down on the sand under your feet. When the low part comes past you, the pressure is relieved, and sand grains start hopping up off the bottom as the water squeezes out of them. This phenomena is called liquefaction. What would happen in a worldwide flood, as the earth is turning under the moon, you would get tides that would go up and down about 200 feet. A 200 foot tidal change every 6 hours and 25 minutes. So the liquefaction would be incredible worldwide because of this flood. It would raise the water 200 feet, which pushes on the sediments, and then the pressure is relieved, which causes all kinds of sorting to happen very quickly. One guy took a giant aquarium and he put a hot water bottle in the bottom, a big rubber bladder with a bazillion little holes in it, and he hooked it to a hose. He put this in the bottom of his aquarium, empty aquarium, and then he took a cement mixer and mixed up uh, rocks, gravel, sand, all kinds of stuff, mixed them together, including dead fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Mixed them all together and dumped them in the aquarium. When he turned the hose on, the aquarium began filling from the bottom as the water is going through this hot water bottle. Well, as it lifts up from the water coming up, it's going to automatically lift things and they're going to fall back down, liquefaction, and they're going to sort themselves by density. He discovered as it filled the aquarium, it sorted everything in the order of birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. Well, that's the order they're going to tell you they evolved in. If you just remember the word farm, F-A-R-M, fish should be at the bottom, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. That's what the evolutionists will say, how they evolved. No, they're not found in that order, number one. And if they are found in that order, liquefaction or the flood best explains it. There's a whole lot more on that in this book right here by Walt Brown. Also, as some layers are less dense, they get covered up by more dense layers. If the conditions are just right, the less dense layer will all of a sudden shoot to the top. It'll break its way through, and it causes what's called, what's called a sand plume. These sand plumes can harden, and probably Ayers Rock in Australia is a giant sand plume, best explained by the flood. If you look at these sand plumes closely, you'll see they have air bubbles all over them. That was the air, the tunnels all over them. That was the air coming out. During an earthquake, the ground can shake and the water in the ground comes to the surface and the top of the ground can become like soup. There was an earthquake in Japan that sank these buildings. The buildings actually sank into the ground because of the phenomena called liquefaction. Water coming to the surface, settling all the sand grains are all loose, almost like quicksand. Evolutionists will say, Hovind, don't you know the birds are found on top? That proves birds evolve last. And clams are found at the bottom. That proves clams evolve first. I say, well, there's a better explanation. You know, maybe clams are found at the bottom because of their habitat. You know, that's where they live. A clam would be the first one buried in a flood. I mean, he's already at the bottom. Hello. A bird's going to be the last one buried because he can fly around until he runs out of gas. Maybe they're sorted based upon their intelligence. As far as anybody can figure out, you know, clams are not too bright. Maybe they're sorted based upon their mobility. Clams cannot run very fast. Maybe they're sorted based upon their body density. Clam shells are heavier than bird feathers. So the sorting of the fossils, if there is any, is not explained by evolution. It's much better explained by a flood. The Bible says the whole earth, the whole world was covered. All the high hills were covered. The mountains were covered. Then the waters assuaged, which means to drop down. NIV says the waters receded. No, 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 they didn't recede, and they weren't wild animals. NIV got it wrong twice in that verse. They were all perfectly tame animals at the, during the flood. But the waters didn't recede. The waters assuaged. The Bible says the waters stood above the mountains. Psalm 104, verse 5 and 6. He Ross teaches it was a local flood in the days of Noah. Uh, excuse me, 15 cubits above the highest mountain, and it's a local flood? I'd like to see that happen. When I debated Hugh Ross, I said, Dr. Ross, do you believe in a worldwide flood in the days of Noah? He said, I believe in a universal flood. Well, that is just a deceitful answer, okay? I said, what do you mean a universal flood? He said, well, it flooded Noah's little universe. Just It flooded the valley that he lived in. I said, would you answer a question then for me, please? If it's just a local flood that floods Noah's valley... Why would God tell Noah to build that huge boat and fill it full of animals and stay in there for a year? Why not tell Noah to move? This local flood idea is dumb. Capital D, dumb. Okay. People say, well, if the world's covered with water, where did it all go? Okay. During the last few months of the flood, the unstable plates of the crust of the earth would begin to shift and some places would sink down. 
Thin spots would sink down, other places lift it up. The water is going to rush off and fill in the hole very quickly, causing erosion very quickly. The Bible says in Psalm 104, At thy rebuke they fled. It's just talking about the water. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. The water rushed off. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them, which is the oceans. What happened was, the mountains lifted up, the water rushed off into the new low places. If we filled this auditorium four feet deep in water, preacher would be upset, I'm sure, but let's just do it for a science experiment, for the good of science. We're going to fill the auditorium four feet deep in water. Then we're going to get all the guys in the school to pick up that end of the building. They pick up that end. All the water is going to rush down, whoosh, over to this end of the building. It's common sense. If the earth were covered with water and some places began to sink down, other places are going to lift up. It's kind of like a water bed. How many have ever slept on a water bed before? You know, my wife is only five feet tall. Well, she gets sound asleep on the side of a water bed. I don't like water beds. We don't have one, but I've slept on them a couple times. You wait till she's sound asleep on her side. I tiptoe in, stand up on a chair, and jump up as high as I can, sh boom, and land on my side of the water bed. She goes whoo, up to the ceiling, comes down, ah, and I sleep on the couch because I don't like water beds anyway. But uh, here, if one place goes down, someplace else is going to lift up. The crust of the earth probably did a lot of flexing during the time of Noah's flood, and probably for the next few hundred or maybe even a few thousand years after the flood. Actually, I think this is still moving around a little bit, causing the earthquakes. There might still be water under the crust of the earth trapped. As some of the water escaped during the hydroplate theory idea, the, the plate would settle down, trapping water under there. There are still huge areas of trapped water. Did you know there are underwater, at the bottom of the ocean, underwater thermal vents, there's hot water squirting up from the bottom of the ocean. Well, duh, where is it coming from? Doesn't it have to come from down lower than that? There's still water in the crust of the earth, trapped down there. The ocean crust is pretty thin, about 3 to 5 miles thick. Continental crust is about 30 miles thick. Any earth science teacher can tell you that. That's been pretty well determined from you know, reading the S&P waves when earthquakes uh, take place. The earth is cracked up, I understand, and it's got a bunch of plates are moving around, and they're still moving a little bit. Pensacola has zero chance of an earthquake, according to this map. Some places have a real good chance of an earthquake. The cracks have been found, and they're still active, still moving. <clears throat> the earth would be like a big water balloon. It would be floating, flexing up and down. Now, we're talking just a few miles on an 8,000-mile earth. A few miles of movement is close to zero in scale here. The water would run off, causing enormous erosion canyons. Just south of uh, Houston, Texas, they had a flood several years ago in New Braunfield, Texas. The water went roaring over as, the, as it flooded and overflowed its dam and caused incredible erosion. If you fly out west and just look at some of the erosion patterns, it's, patterns, it's unbelievable how much erosion this planet has had. You see the three gossips here, the rock spires sticking up out of the ground, or the penguins, or go see the uh, uh, Arches National Park in Utah, or Bryce Canyon. You see these rocks sticking straight up out of the ground. They'll tell you it takes millions of years to erode all this stuff. Yes, boys and girls, millions of years of erosion. I don't think so. That's in my backyard. There's my ink pen on top of it. I had a pile of dirt out there. got rained on one time, and it made erosion marks. Here's millions of years of erosion along a highway built a few months ago. Here's millions of years of erosion. No, I don't think so. I think that's my glasses sitting right there. Erosion can take place quickly. There's uh, obviously great erosion marks in Washington and Idaho from the Missoula flood. There was an ice dam. I believe this would happen after the f real flood of Noah's time, maybe a few hundred years later. Ice caps are melting back, but a big bunch of water got trapped. All of a sudden released itself, <laughs> shot down to Portland, Oregon. Did incredible erosion. Along the way, there's a waterfall, one of the largest waterfalls in the world, called Dry Falls, Washington. But there's no water going over this waterfall. It's totally dry. But when it was flowing, it was probably bigger than all the waterfalls in the world put together. You can study about Dry Falls, Washington, if you want to read more on that. It's also interesting to notice, nearly all the mountain ranges in the world follow the coastlines. As Walt Brown mentioned in his hydroplate theory, that's probably because they formed at the same time as the result of the same event. The mountains arose, the valleys sank down. The flood in Texas, the Guadalupe River flooded, 
had 30 inches of rain in one week. Water overflowed the spillway and did an unbelievable damage to that area around, you know, this city when the, when the dam overflowed. It carved a canyon a mile long, 50 feet deep, and hundreds of yards wide through solid limestone rock. Guadalupe River residents rebuilding after flood losses. Interesting. 70 feet deep in some places. Now keep in mind, it carved this through solid rock. One flood. Little bitty flood. 30 inches of rain in one week. Bent rock layers are also found all over the world. These bent rock layers indicate the rock was bent while it was soft. If you bend hard rock, it's going to shatter and make little fracture lines all along the curves. I was in Crystal Cove State Park in Los Angeles. I saw these bent rocks. I went up to get a picture up real close. The closer I got, the more confusing it is because there are no fracture lines. All these dozens and dozens of layers were still soft mud while they were bent, and then it hardened. All the layers you see in the earth that are bent were all soft at the same time. They are not different ages. A friend of mine's a pilot. He sent me this picture. He said, Brother Hoven, as we fly over Grand Canyon, off to the sides of the canyon, there are sinkholes. The water runs into these holes and goes down, who knows how far, and then squirts out the side of the canyon into Grand Canyon. Well, if it keeps eroding away that sinkhole, it's going to eventually wash out and make another side canyon. After the flood in, in Noah's time, the surface would dry out first, leaving the inside still soft, muddy ground, which would slowly dry out. As it dries, it shrinks and contracts, causing wrinkling on the surface. As mountains lifted up, it would cause metamorphic rock to be formed. This formed, I believe, after, during and after Noah's flood. Skeptics say, well, wait, excuse me, now how did all these kangaroos get to Australia, and why are they only there? Well, the Bible, I believe after the flood was over, the oceans were smaller than they are today. Today the earth is under 70%, 70 of it's under water. I don't think it was that way right after Noah got off the ark. If you look at this map, you can see England and Ireland were part of France. If you'd lowered the water just a few hundred feet, everything would dry up in between England and France. That was probably the beach line way out there. You can see it from this satellite view. If you look very carefully, you can see that's England and Ireland there. You can see under the water and see the, the beach line where it used to be. The water is really very shallow along there. Between Alaska and Russia, the water is only 60 feet deep. About from here to that pole. 60, if you lowered the oceans 60 feet, Russia and Alaska would be connected. If you raise the oceans... America, the whole, all of Central America would flood. If you raise the oceans just, just 10%, this is what America would look like. One little island over in Appalachia and all the Rocky Mountain area, and that's it. All of Central United States would be flooded. Did you know Chicago is only 600 feet above sea level? 600 feet. You know, from here to the stop sign, two football fields. That's how high Chicago is above sea level. If you lowered the oceans a few hundred feet, Florida would be huge. Cuba would be annexed to Florida. I believe during the flood, during the end of the flood, as the oceans filled in, everything got stabilized, and then the ice caps melted back, raising the ocean levels even more. Probably the Atlantic Ocean got too full and spilled over into the Gulf of Mexico. We'll cover more on that in a minute. Pensacola Bay and Mobile Bay are about seven feet deep. You can stand up just about any place out there in Pensacola Bay. If you lowered the waters a few hundred feet, Alaska, I mean, Australia would be connected to Vietnam. The water between Vietnam and Australia is very shallow. So the kangaroos, people say, how did the kangaroos get to Australia? Ah, uh, they hopped. That's how they get everywhere. See, kangaroos and wombats and uh, uh, koalas are non-aggressive. I mean, compared to tigers, they're just not very aggressive. So when animals got off the ark and, and over here in uh, Turkey where it landed, they're going to start spreading out and establishing their territory. And the kangaroo's got his home and he's raising his family and all of a sudden the tigers come in. I want this property. Okay, so rather than fight, they run. They, less aggressive animals would constantly be pushed to the migration fringe, to the edge, okay? They would rather run than fight. And they ended up, you know, over generations, over maybe, who knows, a hundred years or so, they can't keep spreading out, and those that don't run get killed, and they end up in Australia down here. But at the same time, while they're being pushed to the edge of the migration fringe, the water's coming up, 
because the ice caps are melting back. And as the ice caps melt back, the water comes up, and all of a sudden, Australia is protected. It's now an island where it used to be part of the mainland. And they just got as far away as they could get from the tigers, and then that's where they got stuck in Australia. And we have a continental shelf today because of the ice melting back, adding depth to the oceans. If the earth was shrunk down to the size of this globe, you couldn't even find Mount Everest. You ever see those globes where you can feel the bumps on them, you can feel the mountains? That's baloney. They have to greatly exaggerate those mountains. If you shrank the earth down to the size of a cue ball to play pool with, the earth would be rounder and smoother than the cue ball. These, I mean, a five-mile mountain on an 8,000-mile earth is insignificant. We talked about uh, raising the oceans, which greatly changes the shapes of the continents, and so does lowering the oceans. I think these erosion marks happen, uh, these erosion canyons and things happen after the flood. Minneapolis, for instance, is 670 feet above sea level. Well, the Mississippi River runs from Minneapolis to New Orleans. It's about 1,150 miles away. As it runs, the Mississippi drops 670 feet in 1,150 miles. That's seven inches every mile. The Mississippi has to run a full mile to drop seven inches. Very low slope, very gently moving, generally. If you built a dam across Grand Canyon, a really big lake would fill in behind it. Textbooks say over millions of years, the Colorado River carved Grand Canyon from solid rock. I don't think so. I've studied Grand Canyon pretty actively. Grand Canyon had to form as a result of enormous erosion, as we covered on video four, and you saw in Walt Brown's uh, uh, hydroplate theory video clip there. Uh, uh, Grand Canyon is kind of puzzling because the river loops back and forth, but it also has steep sides. Now, a looping river like the Mississippi is usually indication of, you know, low slope, gra gradually sloping ground, so the river loops back and forth. Steep sides usually indicates fast-moving river on high slope. Grand Canyon has both. Steep sides and loops and meanders. And the evolutionists will say, wow, I wonder how that river made that canyon. Uh, the river didn't make that canyon. The flood made Grand Canyon. Very, very quickly. One catastrophe can really re rearrange the real estate. In 1964, there was an earthquake in Alaska that dropped sections of neighborhoods down 40 or 50 feet. I was at Turnigan Heights preaching up there, a couple, going up there again this September into uh, Anchorage, Alaska. The uh, incredible damage done just in a few seconds to that community. When Mount St. Helens blew its top, the whole north side of the mountain slid down into the valley. My sister lived up near there when it happened. This uh, the whole top of the mountain slid off to the side, uncorked the volcano, and steam and ash came shooting out of the volcano at about 100 miles an hour. This ash cloud covered the countryside. My sister got about six inches in her yard. Sixty-some people died as a result of Mount St. Helens blowing all this ash and steam all over the neighborhood. Some of the ash landed in New York City. Most of it landed in this pattern you can see here on this map. Mount St. Helens, the day of the devastation... There was pyroclastic flows that flowed where the red uh, is indicated there, mud flow deposits where the brown is, debris avalanche deposits, lateral blast, just a blast of steam and uh, energy coming out, knocked trees down in the light brown area there. And Mount St. Helens was a small volcano by volcano standards, nothing like Krakatoa in Indonesia. As the swirling mass came down the mountainside, it automatically sorted into layers. This mud flow flowing down the mountain covered up blocks of ice that were blown off the volcano when the eruption took place. Here's a semi half buried in mud. It blew enough mud out that everybody on earth can have a ton of it. It would fill a 10 cubic yard dump truck every second, 24 hours a day for 600 years. That's how much mud was moved out of that volcano. As the mud flowed down, it flowed over blocks of ice that were as big as a house because they were blown off the volcano. It used to be covered by glaciers. Beautiful, beautiful mountain. These blocks of ice under this hot mud exploded, making erosion pits. This happened in a few seconds. Now some teacher is going to bring his kids here someday and say, boys and girls, you see this erosion along the side of this pit? This took millions of years. <laughs> uh, no teacher. My daddy saw this happen. It took about 50 seconds. The landslide of May 8th buried the river and the highway, highway to Spirit Lake to an average depth of 100 feet. 
It also buried most other drainages in the 23 square miles of the upper Toodle Valley and plugged the river's mouth. For 22 months, the water had no established path to the lower waterway. Then on March 19, 1982, an eruption melted a large snowpack that had accumulated in the crater over the winter. The waters mixed with loose material on the slopes of the mountain created an enormous mud flow. In nine hours, while no one watched, happened overnight, the mud flow carved an integrated system of drainages over much of the valley and reopened the way to the Pacific Ocean. The drainages included at least three canyons 100 feet deep. One is nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon of the Toodle because it's a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon. The water was backed up behind the mud slide. When it got too deep, it went over the top. Carved out canyons in a hurry. One canyon is 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep. Happened in a few hours. Once water starts going over a dam, it'll erode out things very, very quickly. You've got one right near here, uh, Grassy Valley, uh, north of Dayton, Tennessee, where the water goes, all the whole area drains down into a big hole and then comes out a few, uh, probably eight miles away in a cave in, not too far from Dayton. I went spelunking in there with Kurt Wise, who teaches up at Bryan College. We went in that cave, spent a whole lifetime, or whole, many years studying this. this. This used to be a cave that went probably all the way down to Chattanooga area, and it's now all collapsed back. Just about five miles of it is left is all. If you go to um, Georgia, south of Columbus, Georgia, there's uh, in a town called Lumpkin, Georgia, there's a huge uh, canyon area there. It's a state park. This great big canyon area started as a result of, they think, of the Methodist church not putting gutters on their building back in 1830, and it started causing a little gully, and the gully got bigger and bigger and bigger, and now it's several hundred acres of eroded ground started it since 1830. When you, go down to the, in, when you go down into the canyons near Mount St. Helens, you will see erosion. Uh, it was incredible there. And it has the sides of the canyon are stratified, nice, neat layers. They say, now, wait a minute. All this mud flowed in here at one time. Why is it stratified? Well, because moving mud automatically stratifies. Get a jar of dirt, add some water to it, and shake it up and set it down. It settles into layers for you very quickly. At the bottom of that big canyon is a little tiny creek called the Toodle River, about from me to the TV right there, 20 feet wide. That little river did not make that big canyon, okay? And that little river at the bottom of the Colorado of Grand Canyon did not make the Grand Canyon either. <laughs> it was formed by a lot more water than that. So the textbooks are lying to you when they say that river made that canyon. Mount St. Helens, when it blew, also blew down bazillions of trees all over the neighborhood. Trees were blown down. It was unbelievable how many trees were blown down. They blocked up rivers. Uh, just incredible damage. You can see the huge semis here next to those giant trees out there in Oregon and Washington State. The trees were hauled out as many as they could. They hauled out thousands and thousands of truckloads of trees and just rescued about 10% of the wood. So many trees were blown into Spirit Lake that you can actually walk across the lake. 2,000 acres of floating wood on the lake, on Spirit Lake. Scuba divers went under this floating log mat and noticed something very interesting. Some of the trees are floating in the upright position. They're getting waterlogged. The root end's going to sink down. As they're floating in the upright position, they slowly sink and stick in the mud at the bottom. Hmm. Many of the trees in Mount St. Helens, in the Spirit Lake there area, are already being covered by sediments and beginning to petrify. And it just happened 20 years ago. Oftentimes, all over the world, petrified trees are found in the vertical position. Petrified, standing up, running through multiple rock layers. The flood is the only explanation for that. We cover much more on that on videotape number four, about petrified trees in the standing position. When that petrified tree falls down, it's going to break up into logs. I don't know if you ever cut down a tree for firewood or not, but when you cut a tree down, it does not break up into logs for you automatically. How many notice that phenomenon when you cut the tree down? Okay, It had to happen when the tree was petrified standing and then fell over as the dirt eroded away from it. Scuba divers here are going under this log mat to see what's going on. The logs are bouncing into each other as the wind blows around, and they're knocking all the bark off. At the bottom of Spirit Lake, there's a layer of bark about three feet thick. If it gets buried by any more debris, it's going to turn to coal. Atheists say, well, it takes millions of years to form coal. No, it doesn't. Coal can be formed in a few hours. There have been many experiments done where they form coal very quickly. 
During the flood, you'd get log mats as big as Texas floating around, where lots of insects could survive for the whole flood, by the way, where a human could not. Insects could survive a flood outside the ark. But these log mats will float around, and they're going to leave behind a debris trail. It's interesting, coal is nearly always found in layers, seams, coal seams, like in Kentucky or Illinois. I debated Jeannie Scott, the president of an atheist organization, and she said, there are 80 layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right. She said, if you look at the amount of coal in the world, the entire biomass or all the plants of the world today could not, be, could not form that much fossil fuel. She's right again. She said, don't you see, there had to be a lot of time to make all this coal. No, she's wrong about that. What there were was big log mats floating around during the flood. They would drift back and forth with the tides and the wind, and they would leave behind debris trails separated by sediments, and then debris trails of, of logs and wood and bark. And you can get 80 layers of coal in one flood. There's a coal mine in Montana. The coal is 200 feet thick and covering 10,000 square miles. In the roof of one coal mine, they find dinosaur tracks. They're digging out the coal, and they look up at the ceiling, and there are dinosaur tracks in the ceiling. Well, during the flood, the dinosaurs were walking around, probably in shallow water, stepping on all these de this debris, this rotting wood, and left their tracks behind. It got filled in by sediments right after they got there. Petrified trees in uh, um, Alabama are standing up, running through two different coal seams. Oftentimes, coal seams, go, you dig along for a while, and pretty soon they come together, branching coal seams. Absolute proof they formed very quickly, not millions of years different in age, okay? This coal mine in Montana, 200 feet thick, coal. And human artifacts are found in coal from time to time. Here's a bell found inside a lump of coal. Here's a vessel found in solid rock, supposed to be 600 million years old. A lady in Illinois broke open a lump of coal. There's a gold chain inside, 10 inches long. A carved stone found in uh, Iowa in a coal mine. Here's an iron pot found in a coal mine in Oklahoma. Here's the sole of a shoe found in Nevada inside a piece of coal. The Bible says the waters assuaged or sank down, and the waters returned from off the earth continually. If a section of the earth sank down, the water would rush in to fill in the hole, but then it would slosh back and forth for a while. There would be tidal waves going back and forth. The Bible says in Genesis 8, the waters were going and returning. That's the Hebrew phrase, halak vashub, going and returning. I believe layers of sedimentary mud were laid out during the flood, and then the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, they would be bent and twisted, and then erosion would take off the surface, depositing more layers on top. That's why we have what's called an unconformity in geology, best explained by Noah's flood. The Bible says the ark rested in the seventh month. Noah didn't get out till the thirteenth month. He stayed in for six extra months. Why? Well, for one thing, there's nothing to eat outside. Number two, the ground is still muddy. And the water was still going and returning. It's not safe to get out of the boat yet. Probably Noah hit bottom, cut off the anchor stones, and then the ark got picked up and moved a few miles and resettled again by another wave coming back as the waters were going and returning. We cover about the Noah's ark anchor stones on video number three of our series. And there's nothing outside to build your house with anyway. The Bible says the waters decreased continually. So in the Hoven theory, the ice caps gradually melted back, slowly raising the ocean levels. During the first few hundred years, there was time to spread out around the world. God came down, confused the languages at the Tower of Babel. People said, I'm out of here. They took off, spread around the world, had their kids and grandkids. And over a few hundred years, the water came up and they ended up trapped where they are today. There's a great book about the spreading of populations around the world after the flood. This book called Noah to Abram. The Turbulent Years. It's in our catalog. You can order that. So people came across to America from both sides. Came across the Bering Land Strait, and you can walk from England to Iceland to Greenland to America if the water was lower. As the ice caps melt back, they leave behind the obvious features that we see. Yes, there really was an ice age, best explained by the flood. And then in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. Peleg was born a hundred years after the flood. I think his daddy named him that because something had changed. It's, there are four theories of what the days of Peleg means. What does it mean divided? What was divided? One theory is the languages and nations were divided at the Tower of Babel. Second theory is the continents moved. I don't buy that one. Third theory is the water came up from melting ice. That would divide the continents. That's probably what, the one I would fall in, the category I would believe. Number four theory is that the land was surveyed. 
they got to be so many people, they said, look, let's, let's just draw some lines on the ground here, okay? This is my yard, and that's your yard, and let's put a rock right here and a rock right here. They started surveying the land and dividing the land up. That's natural. You've got to do that eventually as populations grow. So as the melting ice went into the oceans, the oceans ended up deeper, wider, and colder. Cold water absorbed CO2, so that would take away some of the greenhouse protection, and lifespans were shorter. The deepest point in the English Channel is only 150 feet deep. You know, not even from here to the back wall. So we get these ideas, wow, you know, it's blue, therefore it's water. Yeah, it is, but some of it's deep and some of it's not very deep. I think the flood's the best explanation for that. As the ocean filled in, it would gradually get too full and flow over into the Mediterranean Sea. Probably the Straits of Gibraltar were washed out as the water flowed over and backfilled the Mediterranean. Then it got too full and backfilled past Sicily. Maybe that's why they're finding underwater cities. For the first few hundred years, people would be building their cities in some of these areas. And then all of a sudden the water starts coming up. Hey guys, we've got to get out of here. They had to abandon their cities. Underwater cities are found quite a few places. As the water filled in the Black Sea, they had to abandon the whole civilization there. Underwater cities were found in the Black Sea, under 150 feet of water. They didn't build them there. And today the earth still shows the effects of this flood to remind us God hates sin. Whenever you're pumping your gas in your car, you can think, boy, this came as a result of Noah's flood. This electricity running these lights here is powered by coal probably. They're burning up some of the trees that were growing in the Garden of Eden in the pre-flood world. Every time you see articles in the paper about dinosaur bones, it can remind you of the flood in the days of Noah. See, God left enough evidence behind that anybody with a brain can look around and say, Boy, God, you hate sin. I better live for you. And Satan has worked very hard to take all of the evidence from the planet that shows God's flood, and he's twisted it around, and he's teaching kids today, all this evidence shows evolution. He's taken what God has created as, as evidence and twisting it around. I want to leave you, uh, leave you with this fossil in, in your mind here. This is a fossil of a fish swallowing another fish. Either that or the little one is a dentist. I don't know. Okay. But either one thought they were going to die that day. The big one had the little one halfway down and the flood came and the mud probably covered them up and they, they died. The Bible says it's appointed unto a man once to die, but after this the judgment. Harry Truman lived right on the side of Mount St. Helens. Tim Barron's a friend of mine from... Uh, St. Louis, I'm on their show every Wednesday morning, the Tim and Al show. He told me he witnessed to Harry and tried to get him saved, and Harry wouldn't listen. Harry cussed and swore, and he said, I, I, he listened, but he, he, did, he did not get saved. Well, the officials came in and said, Harry, you live right on the side of Mount St. Helens. This volcano is going to explode. We would like you to move. Harry said, I've been living here all my life, and I'm staying right here. And he did. He stayed right there. He died. Harry's one of those they never found after the explosion. Isn't that stupid to live on the side of a volcano that's about to explode and refuse to move? Wouldn't listen to the warning. You know, it's just about as stupid to know, hey, God sent His angels and His messengers and His Bible and says, hey, this world's going to be destroyed. You better get saved. And people say, I don't want to get saved. I'm staying right here. <laughs> well, duh, you're as dumb as Harry. You ought to give your heart to the Lord and get saved, okay? Harry refused to accept Christ. As far as we know, he's in hell today. I mean, I hope not, but that's as far as we know the case. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. God is not willing that any should perish. If you're here today and you're not saved, God wants you to be saved. He wants to forgive your sin, take you to heaven when you die. But just like it was in the days of Noah, the Bible says, So shall it be when the Son of Man comes back. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage, and they don't care. Got the same thing today. Until the flood came and took them all away, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is coming very soon. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I'd recommend that you get busy and say, God, use me for something. I want to persuade somebody to go to heaven. He's coming quickly. What are you doing with your life? If you want to be saved, if you want somebody to explain to you how to go to heaven, We'll have an invitation at the end of this tape to show you what the Bible says of how you can go to heaven. I hope you've enjoyed this video series on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. 
Much more important, though, than knowing all the truth and facts about science is to know the truth about whether you're going to heaven or not. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, uh, let me explain quickly what you need to do to go to heaven. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. We've disobeyed the Creator. We've, we've done wicked things. We're sinners. Some are worse than others, at least in man's eyes, but we've all broken God's laws. And the Bible says you have to repent. The word repent means to turn. It actually means two things, to turn from your sin and to turn to God. God's looking for a change in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do wrong anymore. I'm sorry, I've offended you. I want to do right. And you turn from sin and you turn to God and say, God, would you please forgive me? Would you save me? The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to admit you're a sinner. Number two, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin. But Jesus died for you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. And anybody that will ask Him for the free salvation, God will give you the gift of eternal life, it says in Romans 6, 23. It's a free gift. And it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you would just call and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? And ask Him. He will give you that free gift of eternal life. Why don't you just pray with me right now and you could receive Christ as your Savior. There's no magic words. God's looking at your heart. But if you could say this and mean it, God would forgive you. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please apply your blood to my account. And forgive my sins and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. So if you've asked the Lord to save you, He promised He'd save you. Now your job is to grow. Read your Bible, pray, get involved in a good Bible-believing church, and begin to grow to be a good Christian. Thank you so much. For more information on the ministry of Creation Science Evangelism, write us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503, or call us at 850-479-3466. That's 850-479-DINO. You may also visit us on the web at www.drdino.com. That's www.drdino.com.